Welcome back to the Hard Run Box News Corner. I decided to take a few days off this week, but I couldn't leave you guys without News Corner on Friday. So I'm back to tackle some of the biggest news topics, including the resignation of Intel CEO, a new Nvidia GPU you definitely shouldn't get excited about, and plenty of other interesting stories. So let's get right into it. The first story came as a bit of a surprise when I was browsing the internet last night. Intel CEO Brian Krasanich has resigned effective immediately due to having a past consensual relationship with an Intel employee. This sort of behavior is against Intel's code of conduct, which prevents relationships between an employee and their direct subordinate. Apparently the relationship ended a while ago, but Intel was only made aware of it recently. Krasanich has resigned from both the CEO position and the board of directors. CFO Robert Swan has stepped up to be an interim CEO while the company explores a replacement. It does seem like this resignation has come at short notice as Intel doesn't have any replacements lined up at the moment. However, the search for a new CEO has begun with Intel looking at both internal and external candidates. Krasanich's tenure as CEO has seen Intel continually post record profits and strong growth. However, some have criticized his leadership throughout recent issues, including Intel's struggles with 10 nanometer fabrication and the whole Spectre and Meltdown fiasco. It will definitely be interesting to see where Intel goes under new leadership, and it could be a refreshing change for a company that is facing increased competition. Nvidia also pulled a surprise move this week, unveiling the Titan V CEO edition. CEO Jensen Huang revealed this new Titan V SKU at the Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference and proceeded to give away 20 units right there. The Titan V CEO edition is a limited edition GPU, and right now it's not a retail product, so there's no price, no launch date, no official specification sheet and no formal announcement. It probably will become a limited time retail product in the future at some ludicrous price, but right now the only units appear to be those given away at this launch. Anyway, the cool thing about the Titan V CEO edition is its VRAM increase to 32 gig of HBM2. This means Nvidia is using eight high stacks, the same used on their 32 gig Tesla accelerators. But it also means another ROP and memory controller partition has been enabled relative to the standard Titan V. The regular Titan V has 12 gig of HBM2, so it has three partitions enabled, leading to 96 ROPs, a 3072-bit memory bus, and 4.5 megs of L2 cache. In pushing the CEO edition to 32 gig of HBM2, the fourth partition needs to be enabled, which means the card has 128 ROPs, a 4096-bit memory bus, and six megabytes of L2 cache. We don't have any other official specifications, so it's not clear what clock speeds the GPU or memory will run at, but if everything remains the same as the regular Titan V, the CEO edition will provide a meaningful performance improvement in both memory bandwidth or ROP limited applications. Curiously, Nvidia also lists the CEO edition as having 125 teraflops of tensor core performance, up from 110 teraflops with the standard Titan V, so there might be some clock speed gains there as well. We'll have to wait and see what the card's final specs are and if it will ever come to retail channels, but for those out there with Titan Vs, just know your $3,000 GPU has now been superseded. AMD is set to overhaul FreeSync 2 shortly to help alleviate consumer confusion over what FreeSync 2 provides and also to update the requirements to get FreeSync 2 certification. This is welcome news for people thinking of upgrading to an HDR monitor in the coming months. It was pretty unclear what FreeSync 2 provided, so hopefully with these changes I won't need to make another 10 minute video explaining what FreeSync 2 is all about. The first change is a minor name update from FreeSync 2 to FreeSync 2 HDR. Considering FreeSync 2 is mostly about HDR support, this change makes it much clearer to buyers what you are getting when you see a monitor with the FreeSync 2 HDR badge. Of course, FreeSync 2 also specifies a lower input latency and mandates support for low frame rate compensation, but the most visible and important feature for buyers is definitely the HDR support. The other change is bigger and arguably more important. FreeSync 2 HDR monitors must now meet the display HDR 600 specification. In other words, a FreeSync 2 certified monitor must support at least 600 nits of peak flash brightness and must cover 99% of the BT709 color space and 90% of DCI-P3. The spec also mandates certain black levels, which mean LCDs conforming to display HDR600 need some form of local dimming. Originally, FreeSync 2 only required display HDR400 conformance. However, that's a fairly weak HDR spec. It doesn't really give a true HDR experience. For example, display HDR400 doesn't 
mandate wider than sRGB colors or particularly impressive peak brightness levels, whereas Display HDR600 does. This change should mean that FreeSync 2 HDR certified monitors will be able to deliver a decent HDR experience rather than potentially no real HDR at all. It's not clear what will happen to monitors that pass the original FreeSync 2 certification. For example, they passed Display HDR400 certification, but would fail the tighter FreeSync 2 HDR process. Hopefully AMD can prevent these monitors from using FreeSync 2 badges on their packaging and remove any references to FreeSync 2 on their website so consumers don't accidentally purchase one thinking they're getting good HDR. Some motherboard vendors are preparing to drop support for Bristol Ridge APUs on their AM4 boards due to lack of space in the BIOS. Most motherboards use a 16 megabyte chip to store the BIOS and associated microcode for all supported processes. However, with AM4 growing to support a wide and wider range of CPUs and APUs, some vendors are running out of space on the chip to store all the microcode they need. The solution, at least in the case of some vendors, is to drop support for the least popular AM4 processes, and in that case it's Bristol Ridge. Considering there is very little reason to buy a Bristol Ridge APU in 2018, there, there really isn't a big loss here. Other vendors have explored expanding the size of the BIOS chip to 32 megabytes. However, the cost of this larger chip is more than double the 16 megabyte chip. Some vendors have looked into using two 16 meg chips, but again, that's a higher cost, which doesn't really work that well with budget boards. Anyway, it's an interesting problem that motherboard vendors are facing. I'm sure future boards will introduce a proper solution that doesn't require dropping support for some CPUs. Intel has once again inadvertently confirmed the existence of 8-core Coffee Lake S CPUs. Over in their resource and design center, Hot Hardware uncovered a customer communication for a Xeon E Coffee Lake S 8-core processor, which indicates that there will be an 8-core CPU headed to Intel's mainstream server lineup in the near future. There's not a whole lot else to say here other than the document details Intel's component sample, identification, and usage guidelines. The document has since been removed, which suggests it was published early by mistake. Hopefully it won't be too long until we hear more about Intel's 8-core processor, not just for Xeons, but also for standard desktops. Moving into some more quicker topics of this week, Samsung has announced a new 8TB SSD that uses the NF1 form factor. The drive is unnamed at the moment, but it does feature 16 512GB NAND packages and a new controller that supports both PCIe 4.0 and NVMe 1.3. If you're wondering what the NF1 form factor is, it's basically a modified wider M.2 designed for enterprise that allows a single SSD stick to pack two rows of chips per side. This means better density, which is crucial for some enterprise customers. Performance wise, we're looking at 3.1 and 2.0 gigabytes per second sequential reads and writes respectively, along with 500K IOPS random reads, but just 50K IOPS random writes. The drive is available now though, as with a lot of enterprise products, there is no public price. And if there was, it'd probably blow our minds anyway. Acer has launched two new monitors, if you can really call them monitors. One is a 49-inch IPS LCD, and the other is an even larger 55-inch IPS LCD. Not sure why anyone would want to sit in front of a 55-inch monitor, especially for productivity tasks, but I guess it might make sense for gaming. Both pack 4K resolutions and HDR support, although brightness tops out at just 350 nits, and there's just a 1200 to 1 contrast ratio. So don't expect great HDR there. We're looking at pricing of around 550 50 US for the 49 incher and 800 US for the 55 incher. Oh, and before I move on, these are the official names of the monitors the EB490QKBMIIIPFX and the EB550KBMIIIPX. Are you actually serious, Asa? Is that the best you could come up with for a monitor? Gee, some monitor names are just horrendous. Anyway, some cool looking monitors from Asa and we'll get those fairly shortly. Western Digital has expanded their line of purple hard drives with new 10 and 12 terabyte models that are deep learning capable and include all frame AI technology. Yep, they are marketed as AI optimized surveillance drives, hard drives that are AI optimized. Anyway, they're available now, priced at $400 for 10 terabytes and $480 for 12 terabytes. The Steam Summer Sale is now on, so head over to the Steam store and check out all the deals, buy a few games you won't play for years, complete the usual set of mini games and other fun stuff, get good deals on popular tiles, you know the drill, it's on now, so go check it out. 
And one last rumor to finish this news corner off. Hong Kong website HKEPC suggests the name of AMD's upcoming 32-core Threadripper CPU is the Threadripper 2990X. The rest of the specifications they're claiming don't seem right at all, such as the 3.4 gigahertz base clock and 4.0 gigahertz single core boost when AMD has already said the CPU, at least for their test systems, using a 3.0 gigahertz base, but the name is pretty cool. Hopefully AMD goes with it. Anyway, that's it for this week's News Corner. Don't forget to subscribe to get this new segment in your inboxes every single Friday. Consider supporting us on Patreon where you can get access to our exclusive Discord channel. That's it for this one. I'll catch you next time.